I can't start talking about the lecture without the markers, though. As fast as you can get back, whiteboard markers. My office. Next to the whiteboard. There's two whiteboards in my office. There's markers in both of them. But not the whiteboard in the classroom. I guess quality control, right? Quality control would keep us from shipping crap to our customers. And so let's, let's spend a minute looking at that right now. So our, let's kind of draw this on the board. But just imagine that I'm drawing it on the board. So we talked earlier in the term about the, the path to get paid as a manufacturer. When we're looking at our job shop model type business. We have the RFQ, right? So they. The customer decides they need something. They ask us how much would it cost. We give them a quote. They give us a purchase order. We do the engineering, the setup, and the programming. We set up the machine. We make the part. We check the part. We ship the part to them. We send them an invoice. We get paid. Those are the steps that get us paid as manufacturers. And we talked about the ability to use computers to automate some of those steps throughout the class. And so what I want to talk about primarily today is, so I, I mentioned quality at the very beginning, like the quality of having markers would be nice. So we ensure quality with quality inspection, right? We make sure we don't ship crap to our customers by doing some sort of inspection before we send the stuff to our customers. Now we can do statistical process control and we can design our processes so that we don't make bad parts. But especially at the beginning of any production run, we're going to check the parts before we send them to our customers. And when I asked the groups to come up with different ways that we could automate this type of a manufacturing business, one of the groups at least came up with this idea of automating inspection. So let's think about what we would do if we needed to automate the inspection step. What's the first thing we have to know? We're going to automate the inspection step. Right, so we need to have a clear definition of what it should look like. And so, so let's, let's sort of mentally design the system that does this. So by knowing what it is we want, should we have like a, uh, a printed out blueprint of the part? Because if we're doing inspection in the old fashioned way, we would typically have a blueprint of the part and we'd go to some inspection table or inspection room in the factory and we'd say, all right, this length, this length, is supposed to be five inches plus or minus point, uh, point oh one five inches, right? So it's five inches plus or minus point oh one five inches. And we would, how would we measure that length? So if we had five inches plus or minus point oh oh one five caliper, caliper would be a great way to measure that, right? Definitely within the capability of measurement of a caliper. Um, it's close to the capability of measurement of a tape measure, right? So it's at the bottom edge of resolution for a tape measure. It's very comfortable to measure with a caliper. So that's it's one of the things we have to look at when we're doing inspection is, can the inspection tool I'm using 
actually measure the thing that the customer cares about. So if we, did it make sound like I do it? No. If we had, um, I'll bring this over here because that's the that's the live mic today. So I'll try to not get too far away from it. Um, so if we have something like that, I think my markers are coming. I can hear them. Thank you. All right. So let's say this is this is a uh, this is our finished part, and let's say it's got pocket in it. And one, two, three holes in it. And it's got some. We do three views here. Right, so the things that we're going to need to call out here are this length and this length, right? So there's, I mean, in order to make this part, you have to know those two dimensions. And you have to know this dimension. And what else do I have to know in order to make this part? Yeah. The size and implications of the hole. Right, so I'm gonna to need to know the diameter of the holes. So uh, what do we call this? 3.5 inches, 5 inches. So if we're sort of to scale, what does that make these like a half an inch? Something like that. All right. So this diameter. And let's see, there's three of those. So three of them, half inch diameter, um, and would need to have the locations, and we need to know these radiuses, right? And these dimensions. And then we could make this part. And so if we were gonna inspect this part with calipers, and let's just assume that all of the dimensions, all the dimensional tolerances on this part could be measured with calipers, so what would you do to measure the part? What would your process be to measure the part? Probably do like sort of an outside in type thing where you get the biggest measurements first and then work okay. it out. So you'd measure, you'd measure the length and the width and the height maybe yeah. first, because um, if those dimensions are wrong, the rest of them don't matter. Although those are probably the easiest ones to hit. Um, if we don't have any super tight tolerances on that, then once you've done that, how are you going to measure the location of the holes? Somebody else. How are you going to measure the location of the holes? If you try to subtract the diameter of the hole, if you put that to the edge of the... Okay. So you can use a caliper to measure this edge to here. And this edge to here, you could do that. Um, and once you've done that, you could also use a caliper to measure the diameter of the hole. Is that the best way to measure the diameter of a hole? No, I think maybe you can have like a another. It's like a rod that's like maybe slightly smaller and slightly bigger than so both sides. Of yeah, often what we do for the diameter of a hole is we use a pin. They have pin gauges and they have they're incremented by thousands or ten half a thousandth of an inch and you see which one fits in so the one that fits in it's bigger than that the next one up it doesn't fit in you know it's in between those two so it's a great great way to measure the diameter of a hole um sort of and likewise we could for these radii on the inside of our pocket how do we measure those So you take something of a known radius, like a, like a 
ball bearing or a BB or something like that of the known radius. And you push it up in there, and you see if light goes past it. So if you've got a big, uh, you've got a radius that's too big, it'll do this, and you'll see light over here. If your radius is too small, it won't fill all the way out to the corners. All right, so that's a typical way that we would manually measure a radius like that. Uh, we use a radius gauge. Okay. And so to do all those measurements on this part, how long do you think that would take us? If you're fast, like five minutes? Yeah, so I think it's somewhere between his half hour and your five minutes, right? So the first one would probably take you like a half hour if you haven't done it a lot, right? You figure it out exactly how am I going to measure this. You're getting the right set of gauges out to do all this. Now, if we were going to automate this measurement, what would our process be? So we're in this computer-aided manufacturing. So if I wanted to automate this measurement, what would our process be? We could take a six-axis robot. I've seen people do it. I've seen people take a six-axis robot and put a little bearing or a little, little BB and have a laser that shines through with a light detector on the other side and push that into the corner to measure the radius. But that's not the way we would do it, right? What do you got? Reverse. Reverse. Um, so, all right, so we could make um, like a go no go gauge that we could slip it onto that had all the in inverse features. Yes. Yeah, I don't, wouldn't do it that way though. But yes, physics says that would work. It would tell us if everything was correct, it wouldn't tell us which thing was wrong. I don't know what this is called, but I see people use on cars. It's like a when they go across, you can like uh, take like few measurements on like curved surfaces and stuff. Yeah. So I have those propped up, have a robot arm pull the part, just scan the whole thing and have like a good part download us to compare it to that and see if like certain areas are too small, too big, whatever, then throws to the side it's bad. So you're gonna use a magical, I call it magical. They, they, they're science based, but I, any any science or engineering that you can't explain with words must be magic, right? I think I see. Right. That's that's the definition of magic. Anything we can't explain with math. So I, I heard one of the people I know say the company they do to use is like they put this on the conveyor belt, they have like a laser array that can detect how much distance it is from the laser array, then they can kind of remodel the part inside the computer and they can try to do that. Okay. All right. So, who else had a thought still? All right. Hold your thought for a second. I want to talk about these two ideas because they're very similar. Um, in your sense, you're moving the part with a conveyor. And in your sense, you're moving the part with a yeah. robot. Um, and both techniques are used. Um, so, your magical laser scan, well, I said lasers. Now I've, now I've just let part of the cat out of the bag. Your magical scanner thing that tells you how big things are usually uses laser triangulation. And um, it's very similar to like the barcode readers at the grocery store, except different laser distances and different setups, light detectors. But basically, in your, in your laser scanner thing that's looking at the part going by on the conveyor is very similar to this too. We've got, we can... From any point in space here, I can tell you how far away this point is with one of these laser systems. If I shoot it out there, and what it does, it, it looks at, a lot of times it's triangulation, so you have a sensor offset at, a, at an angle and you see how far did the light have to go to get back to the sensor and stuff like that. There's different, different tools that they use for this. Another way is to project a pattern onto it with like, with like a room classroom projector kind of thing. You put a pattern of stripes on it. You put a camera over here, and you look at it from over here, and what you look, you know what the stripes are supposed to look like if the background was flat. So you can see the changes in what the stripes look like to tell you those different distances and stuff like that. And so we could use 
one of these height measurement devices. So this is, it's, it's, it's just a distance measurement device. You, you can use, I mean, there's laser triangulation, there's confocal laser, there's all kinds of different technologies that can make that height measurement. And what both of you are doing is you're building a three-dimensional, building sort of a three-dimensional, I was sighing not because of the three-dimensional, but because of the, the need to draw it, right? You're, you're getting this, and so we've got this pocket in here, and our three holes that I didn't draw very well, and you get a map of what that surface looks like. And, and that, when that map comes back to you very often with this type of device is a point cloud. So you get a bunch of XYZ coordinates. And then you could plot those XYZ coordinates in a graph. And who said we needed to know what it was going to look like? You did, right? Well, you could take your solid model for what it was supposed to look like. And you can try to line those two things up with each other. And you can see what's the difference between what we measured and what the solid model is. Right, so that is a tool to do this. But this is a simple part, right? We can measure it with calipers. So those, those tools of getting a 3D map of the surface. And to be able to these tools, they do digital sampling of the surface, right? So it's not, it doesn't capture the whole surface. It captures the points that it measures. So the, um, the easy way to visualize it, so the, the, the three-dimensional ones where there, people are waving the wand around here, it uses the same idea. But the easy way to think about it is with your laser scanner, right? So you're getting... A bunch of heights. So first you're you're measuring across and you're getting all the same height across as the part comes through because it's just measuring conveyor. Then you start to get to the edge. Let's what if the part's a little bit crooked on the conveyor? Maybe it measures that point first, and then maybe it measures two points next to it, then maybe it measures these points with all, all the points in between, right? And so it'll start to build up that model as the piece goes through. On the edges, you'll get measurement artifacts that uh, spikes or things like that. It's normal for that kind of measurement. So you'll have to filter the data and clean it up a little bit. But this is a simple part, right? What if I, I did this just the other day? I had some odd shaped parts. And I needed to get some measurements of them. And I couldn't find a piece of graph paper. What I really wanted was a piece of graph paper. I couldn't find a piece of graph paper, so I took a manila envelope or manila folder and unfolded it. And I took a ruler and I made some grids on it. They were one inch apart from each other with a ruler and a pen. And then And then I, uh, I took pictures of the parts sitting on the grid. I'll hold this up to the thing here. So I got a picture of my parts sitting on the grid. I made a note on a sticky paper that said how many pieces I had that looked like this. Right, so you just put it on the grid and take a picture of it. Cooler if I put it up on the screen. This gets the point across. <clears throat> and then from that, in software, is what the uh, what the people want to know about these parts is like what's the biggest rectangle they could cut out of it. So it's not round now; it's, it's scrap material left over from a previous project. They want to know what what are the size rectangles we could cut out of it. So now in software in the computer, you could cut this up into a whole bunch of different squares. And we've calibrated it by putting those marks on it. And you could calibrate it with a better scale than that, right? 
Um, and so very often to measure a simple part like this, we would use something like an optical comparator, which is basically taking a picture with a grid behind it. Um, and you'll, you'll scan that picture and you'll compare it with what it's supposed to do. Now we gotta get a height also, right? And so maybe you'd measure that height with the caliper, do everything else with the optical comparator. And you could have a conveyor that brings the parts in and the good ones continue on to packaging, the bad ones get kicked out, right? So this is one way that you could automate that inspection. It works really well when all the parts look the same. But every time you have a new part, you've got to reprogram that system that's going to do that automated inspection. <clears throat> and so it would be really cool if there was software that could automatically take our, um, our solid model and take our measurement tool. It doesn't have to be one of these scanners. It could be the 3D scanner. It could be the 2D optical comparator type scanner. Um, it could be a coordinate measuring machine. So when we've set up the, uh, the milling machines, we use the little Ruby probe to go touch the parts and stuff like that, figure out where the parts are. So you can have a machine that just does, drives with those Ruby probes around. It goes and touches parts all over the place, called a coordinate measuring machine, a CMM. And you could program it using the solid model to know where you want it to go, to go measure a bunch of different parts. It can measure the circle. So what's the problem with measuring that, that hole diameter with a caliper or a pin gauge? Doesn't tell us if it's round. Doesn't tell us if it's a cylinder, right? If we measure it with a caliper at the top edge, the bottom edge might be a different shape. So with a CMM, you could measure 50 points around that diameter. You could measure 50 circles through the depth of it. So with the CMM, you can get more information about the actual true shape of that part. It matters more when you have higher tolerances. Does that make sense? So to automate inspection, we've got to know about what the part is. We've got to know about the measurement technology and the method we're going to use to do it. Um, sometimes with the inspection, all we're caring about automating is the data collection, right? So you could have a caliper that's got a wire coming out of it or a Bluetooth coming out of it. And every time you measure a part, it puts it in a spreadsheet for you. So then you're automating the step of writing it down, right? So you don't have to do the writing it down part. So when you're doing these mechanic, mechanical measurements, especially if you're doing it to control a process, you're often measuring the part, writing it in a notebook, and then maybe making an adjustment to your process and measuring the next part, right? So you can do these things. And so some step of that automation could just be getting it into the computer, making the graph for you. Does that make sense? All right, so that's sort of automating, or that's talking about doing the measurement because we can send all the invoices we want and if we have shipped crap to the customer before we ship them the invoice, they're not gonna pay the invoices. In fact, they're gonna back charge us. They may charge us for disposal of the stuff. They may charge us to fix it. And they certainly aren't gonna to wanna to continue doing business with us. All right, so doing that inspection is important. You actually have to, I, I feel like when you send in the quote, so the RFQ and the quote, when you're sending in that quote, you should know how you're gonna measure the parts. Because if you don't know how you're gonna measure the parts, you don't know how much it's gonna to cost to make the parts. Um, all right, so that's the inspection part. Years ago, I, um, long, long ago in a galaxy far, far away, years ago, I was invited to participate in a, a, a project that was pretty, it's a pretty cool project. What their goal was is to take a, um, well, they were aircraft components. They were actually helicopter components. Um, take, uh, take this part of the helicopter engine that had worn out over time. 
So, you know, if you, especially things that vibrate, if you get a rotating thing like a bearing or something and, and it vibrates a lot, it sort of wallers out the hole. That's the technical term, wallering out. So you make the hole bigger over time. And eventually it gets so big that the vibration gets worse and then you can't use it anymore. And rather than making a new casting and remachining a new casting and basically building a new transmission for your helicopter, what you do is you take, well, the traditional way to do it is to put it on a shop floor and a guy with like a MIG welder goes, <laughs> fills in the hole with welded material, presumably the same alloy that the casting was made out of. And then, uh, and then maybe grind it flat and then you put it back in a, uh, in a milling machine and you rebore out the hole where it's supposed to be. You put in a new bearing, put it back in the helicopter and you go fly around. That's the traditional way to do it. The, the goal of this project was to be able to sort of drop a shipping container or a couple of shipping containers out of the back of a C5 in a remote location and um, be able to go fix helicopter transmissions without having to ship them back to the States, without having to have a skilled, experienced operator there. So this makes, it makes sense, right? We'd like to be able to do that. So what was the process? What were the steps we had to do to do this? We had to locate the damage. You had to fill in the damage. And then you had to remachine out the good part. You had to inspect to make sure it was a good part and then put it together, put it back in the helicopter. Right. So this project, they had told Congress that they could do it. So now they had to do it because they already told Congress they could. And, um, and they were building this system. And so the initial version of the system, the, uh, and so the, instead of using a MIG welder to fill in the hole, they were using a technology called cold spray. And it's very similar to thermal spray, except not quite um, in, in thermal spray or plasma spray, the, the particles that you shoot at the substrate are really, really hot. Plasma means like really, really hot. Thermal is almost as hot as plasma, but not quite plasma. And cold spray just means it's not quite as hot as thermal spray. So it's still pretty hot, but they're using, was the, I think it was 900 PSI helium or nitrogen to push the particles through a really small orifice. They're moving really fast. They slam into the substrate and stick. So you, you throw a little particle so fast that it slams into the substrate and sticks. And so they, they could do this. This is a process that's developed. And so they would use like a six axis robot with this little cold spray nozzle and they go spray the material back on and they could fill in the hole using cold spray. Of course, they had to program where the nozzle was going to point. Right. So some skilled operator would program where the nozzle was going to point to do all this intricate stuff. Um, then they would, uh, the, the goal was then to automatically CNC machine out the hole that you needed to have left over. So you fill in the big hole, you make a smaller hole. So they had a tool changer. They go put down their cold spray nozzle. They grab a uh, spindle in their six axis robot. And then they're going to go try to machine that bearing race or the, the hole for the bearing to go in. So what's the problem here? Who's ever used a six axis robot? So you think you could do cutting forces at the end of a six axis robot arm? Not, not without having a lot of vibration, right? You can certainly pick up the spindle and you could spin the spindle and you could go touch the workpiece, but they found they had a lot of chatter. And so this was, they were, they were discovering that just as I started on the project, because that was when they were switching from nitrogen to helium. My part of the project was to make sure purchase orders went through for the purchase of a helium recovery system. Helium is not a, uh, you can't make new helium. You can only find it. And so they, uh, they wanted to collect all the helium they were using. So they didn't waste it. And, um, but I got invited to go to all the meetings for the thing. 
And I said, well, why don't you just use a machine tool instead of putting a spindle on the end of your robot? They said, oh, oh, that's a good idea. So then they decided they needed a uh, $6 million machine tool. Uh, long story. Anyway, the whole process, though, they said was going to be automated from identify the problem, um, machine out the bad area, cold spray in the new stuff, machine out the space, inspect it, put it back in the thing. What they had never done was all of those steps independently. So the, the software to automatically find the hole, I don't know, I, I told them that if I could probably develop that software and the, the system to do it, and it would cost about $3 million in five years because it didn't exist. Nobody was doing it yet. But, but we all feel like these automation systems should exist because those scanners exist, right? They, they do. You can go buy them. I, I see them at trade shows. You can buy them on the internet. The, the conveyor scanner things, they exist. Software actually exists to compare those measurements to the solid model, but not the whole thing, because then somebody's got to program that five axis CNC machine tool also. Right? You got to translate all that stuff. Anyway, so that, that project failed miserably. Yep. And then when they did the next project to fix it, they requested me to be part of it because I was the only one that said the first one wouldn't work. And, uh, and I looked at the plan and I respectfully said, no, nah, this was not going to work either. But um, the reason it wasn't going to work isn't because you couldn't stitch all those technologies together. With the people in this classroom, they gave us three years and enough money to pay everybody to keep them happy and enough money to buy all the tools and computers we wanted to buy, which I think would be less than $3 million total. We could stitch all that together. We could figure out how to do all those steps for this single purpose or, or multi-purpose fix it machine, except for the one that's the most important. The one that decides whether or not the finished part's gonna work is the setup of the machining operation, I think. And so how does that setup of a machining operation work? You've all set up a machine tool. What are the things you do when you set up the machine tool? So when you're setting up the machine, so you know you've got the program, you've got the stock material, you know what the finished part needs to look like, you know how you're going to do your inspection, what are the steps you do when you do the setup? And what's the function of each step? You, you put the uh, tool in the spindles. Spindle. All right, so you've got to put tools in the spindle. Can we automate that? Yeah, we can automate that. In fact, there was a really good MQP a few years ago that used, if you when you go into uh, WashPro 108, right on the left-hand side, there's a couple of yellow robots. One of them's in a big blue box. They used that one that was in the big blue box, and they were actually assembling milling tool holders. So if you sent that thing a list of what tools needed to be set up, it would assemble the holders and put the right length of the tool sticking out. So you can definitely, you can automate this and you can automate the getting it into the spindle. So we could do that. All right, what's the next step? What else do we have to do besides put the tools in the spindle? You have to probe to get the position of the stuff. All right, so we have to, well, before we can even do that, we gotta put the stock in the, in the machine, right? And we can do that with a robot. We can do that, we can automate that part. But we gotta then locate the stock. So we gotta find the stock. And can we do that? Can we automate that? If we sort of put it in the right place, we can go use the probe to automate it. I've had processes that used magnetic fixturing, and what the operator did was they walked over to the machine, put the stock sort of in the center of the fixture, 
press the start button, the door would close, the magnet would turn on, the probe would come out and find the material. So you could do that. <clears throat> so we still haven't gotten to why I say it's difficult to do. What else do we have to do? We need to do more than just put tools in the spindle, put stock in the machine, find the stock. Well, first off, how do we put the stock in the machine? So we could automate it, but what, what physically has to happen? We have to have a fixture? What's the fixture have to do? Hold it in place. Has to locate it and hold it in place. Right? So the fixture has to locate. It has to locate it and when it's holding it, so it has to locate it well enough that we can find it with our probe. It has to hold it. How does it, how well does it have to hold it? So it has to hold it good enough so it doesn't move relative to the cutting force. And that includes doesn't vibrate. Right, so you may have to dampen vibrations. All right, so we've got a put stock in the machine, fixture, locate, hold, don't let it move. We can then locate it. And when we do this part, if we're using the probe, what, what happens in the machine tool? What's the step that happens when we find the stock with the probe? What happens in the machine tool? Or is it just magic? I press the find the stock button. So what, what, what actually happens in the machine tool controller when we do this? Well, first he says switch to put the probe in it. And after he needs to move like close to it. Right. So we switch, we put the probe in. So when we're physically watching it, it's pretty easy to watch. So we put the probe in. Let's assume this pen is the, the probe. The little blue thing here is the tip, right? So the probe comes over, bring it down, and we're finding the Z surface, let's say. It's going to come down, it's going to touch here, it's going to notice when it's touched, it's going to go back and it might touch a couple times at different speeds so that it can be sure that it knows where that, well, so that it can be sure it knows when it touched. But what, what else has to be true in order for that to matter? What does the machine have to know? Well, I guess that's to, you want to be sure that the thing is flat. All right, so it needs to be flat, well, it needs to be the correct angle. Right. Flat might not be the correct angle, but flat's the easiest one to know, right? So it needs to be at the correct angle relative to the direction of motion of the machine. What else? And so to, to know if it's at the correct angle, we might have to measure more than one Z location to find the plane and the angle of that plane. Okay. Yeah. It needs to know the fixture, like fixturing size, whatever it is that's but holding it. It needs to not run into the fixture when it's doing that step, right? So, but what I'm thinking, so when we, when we probe, all right, so we're going to probe Z in the machine. And when I touch that part, it beeps, right? The probe comes down, so I got, here's the top of my part, here's my probe. Check it out. Ruby. When the Ruby touches the part, the machine says beep. What else happens when the machine says beep? Can we write the Z offset or Z? So, in a table in the machine tool, and so this is. G54, all right, 55, 56, it could be a whole bunch more. And this G54 is just the number that designates the location in the memory of the machine tool. So it's the way we call this information out of the machine tool. There'll be an X 
a Y, and a Z. And so when the proof says B, and we're moving down in Z, we're proving the Z axis, the proof says B, it puts a number like minus 14.217. Eight here. What does that number mean? That's where you assume the C zero in your cam number is. Well, no, this number right here, you, you never put 14, 14.2178 in your cam software. Yeah, it's, it's from, yeah. Is that measured from where the machine thinks the cone is? In in this instance, if if it's a negative number here, then it's probably going to be measured from the maximum Z travel of the spindle up. And so it counts how far down it comes before it touches the surface. And when it touches the surface. It beeps, but this is a measure. So if we're looking at the machine tool. I've got my spindle. I got just the bottom of the spindle, my tool holder, I have my probe, I got my probe tip. And when this is at the top of its travel, it's Z equals zero. As it moves down, Z is equal to a negative number. It's, it's kind of nice that going down makes Z more negative. It's intuitive for the operator later. You can do it the other direction. It's a setting in the machine. But it's nice when Z equals zero is at the top and all the Z values coming down are negative. Okay, so as it moves down, this becomes more and more negative. But it's triggering when the tip of the probe touches the part. Turns out that when you want to measure really small things, what you do is you switch the probe tip. And so you can get a really short probe tip. Well, it's usually you want a really small diameter probe tip. But when they make the really small diameter probe tip, they also make it shorter because of the whole length to diameter ratio thing it's stronger when it's shorter. Right? That makes sense? So if I switch the probe tip out, it came down, this number might say 16. So it's not enough to just run that probing macro. What else has to happen? Yeah. So you need to know how long the probe is. That's how we typically think of it. It is how we typically think of it. Is we feel like we want to know what's this distance. Because in our mind, we're looking at the spindle without a tool in it. And then you could replace this tool with different tools, right? And if we know the relative length of those different tools, so, so we've got, these are work offsets. We've also got tool offsets. So we've got our tool offsets. And one, two, three, up to like 99 or something like that. It depends on the machine tool on how many it'll hold. I know I've, I've recently seen a machine that had 350 tools in it. And they would go, they go around to this big chain conveyor that goes outside the machine and stuff. And you could, you could change the tool while the other tool's cutting because it's outside the machine when you're changing the tool. It's kind of cool. Um, so we'd have a length here of minus or positive minus, I don't know, depends on the sign that we're using. But 
And so you take this 5.1615, add it to the minus 162178, and that would tell you where the tip of the spindle is relative to the workpiece. And when you're using, when you're running the program in the CNC, you have to have the work offset and the tool offset or else the spindle crashes into the workpiece. Does that make sense? But it adds those two together. <clears throat> How do you know this distance here when you're setting it up? Yeah, right, so in the machine tool, somewhere on our machines, it's usually on the left hand side, somewhere over here, we've got a probe that we can bring the tool over and touch the tool onto the probe, right? We call it, so we call this the part probe. We call this the tool probe. Right, so I can bring my tool over and I can bring it down and it beeps. But how does it know this distance? It just knows what number like this it was at when it beeped. Your tool probe has certain highs and your spin up certain highs and you subtract it. Yeah. So the way it works, we've got our spindle. We've got a spindle with our tool. We got our tool probe that's down here bolted to the table. And let's say we've got our part over here. So first off, we take our probe. And without turning on the probe, we bring it over here and we measure, we bring it down so that the probe touches off the tool probe. So we've calibrated the length of our probe. We also calibrate the diameter of the probe, different step, right? Then we put our tool in. And we bring that and we touch this probe. The difference between the number from the probe and the tool is the difference in height between the probe and the tool. Right? Okay. And so we calibrate the probe, we probe all the tools. Then when we take the probe and we bring it down over here, we're finding the difference between this and this. So that makes that work offset be this distance from here to here, as long as we've calibrated the probe down here. We don't have to use the probe. And we don't have to use the tool pre-setter. We can bring the tool so that it just touches the table. And we could do that with all the tools. And so when it just touches the table, we could press the button that says, this is zero. And then we can take any one of those tools 
and have it just touch the top of the workpiece. And that would effectively measure this distance, right? And that would be our work offset, and we would subtract that from all the tools in order to have the tools interact with the top of the workpiece. <laughs> What's the problem with just touching the table? Ignore the fact that not all the tools will reach that far. It depends on which machine you're using. Just touching isn't really an exact like, measurement. You just kind of have to look at it. So the yeah, just touching is just what the um, the real. And so when they when they teach people how to do this, they use a piece of paper. I don't know if I have a piece of paper. Maybe I have a piece of paper. When you don't want back. Alright, so how thick is this piece of paper? If you had a caliber, caliper, could you find out? Yeah, you can measure this. Let's, let's say that it's, I don't know, 40 thou. No, it's not 40 thou. 4 thou. Alright, so let's say it's 4 thou thick. So we measured it with our caliper, we know how thick the piece of paper is. We, um, we jiggle the piece of paper on the table. So we're, we're moving the piece of paper like this. We're bringing the tool down. And you can feel it. When the tool tip just touches the piece of paper, you can feel it. Actually, you're, the human's pretty sensitive to that kind of a thing. Thing. You, you can definitely feel that. And so at that instant, oh, what do you do then? Stop turning the wheel. Good plan to stop turning the wheel. What happens if we go one more click at that point? If we go one more click at that point, the tool breaks. Guaranteed. Every time, pretty much. I've seen a few exceptions. If we're in the, like, one ten thousandth per click. We might have to go two or three clicks before the tool breaks. But if we're in the one thousandth per click, the tool's gonna break because it has no force feedback. It goes exactly to the spot you told it to go to, regardless of what you intended. Where you wanted it to go until it just hit the surface, it's gonna go to the spot you told it to go to, which was say five thousands below the surface. And to do that, it will apply thousands of pounds of thrust down and the tool will go, think. I can actually always tell when that's how the tool broke. It's because it, one flute is always a little bit longer than the other. Something's a little bit crooked when this happens. And so one little flute spirals off about a quarter of an inch up. Just think, it's gone. I can always tell that that's how somebody broke the tool. Um, but if you're good, you stop going when you feel it drag on the paper, right? Of course, pretty wasteful to use a piece of paper every time, right? And who has a lot of paper laying around when they're in the shop? Most of us don't, right? But we do have little scraps of paper that we find. And so what we do is we tear off the little corner of the page we're making notes on, and we set the tool, and then we throw it on the floor. And then we need to set the next tool. Or maybe we'll set two tools with this one. Oh. Oh. Yep. And you tell people that work at shops that use this method because you walk around, there's little friggin' scraps of paper all over the place. So don't do that. Instead, when the tool's coming down, take like a dowel pin of known diameter. How do you know what the diameter is? Measure it. I have a dowel pin of known diameter. I bring the tool down so close that the dowel pin cannot fit under it. But not so close that accidentally, if I do one more click, it's going to crash into the table. That sounds pretty fair, if the dowel pin's big enough. I bring the tool down. I try to roll the dowel pin under it. Dowel pin doesn't roll under. I go up one click. 
I bring the tool, oh, now the dial pin goes under. So now I know it's somewhere between that previous click and this one. So I make my movement increment smaller and maybe go down five because they go smaller by 10 times. And oh, now it just touches, I come up one until it just rolls under. And you can do that down to the 10,000th increment. And when it just rolls under, and you're using the 10,000th increment, then you know that somewhere between the 10,000th of an inch below that and that setting is where the zero is, right? So you can get it to within one 10,000th of an inch for Z for that measurement, which is actually better than the probes do. Um, all right, so you can do that. Use something that you can slide under it. Never jog down with the thing still under the tool because it breaks just like you ran into the table. I always, when I'm gonna jog down or jog up, because what if I turn the handle the wrong way? So I'm turning the handle, I roll my thing, oh, it doesn't go under. Before I turn the handle again, I put my hand behind my back, and I go down one click, then I try it, put my hand behind my back, maybe I go up one click, but that way I don't accidentally jog into the thing. So to get the most precise setup and location, it almost always involves some sort of a manual operation. Something like, well, even the calibrating the probes, even if you're gonna use the probe to do it, you need a, a manual setup. The reason that the, um, the Army's thing wasn't gonna work wasn't because it was impossible to do. They didn't have all the technology lined up and they didn't have enough budget to do all the lining up of it. That was, but those were just technical things. The reason it wasn't gonna work is because they didn't understand the capabilities of the machine tool and the tolerances that they needed to hit. And um, we got, we're right at 10 o'clock. I wanna take a little break. Cause I had a whole cup of coffee I didn't drink yet. So, what, you got three person group? You're solo again? So once you form up over here and, and you got a three person group, a three person group, you guys can work together as a six person group. That would be fine. Um, what I would like you to do is prepare three to four slides that explains machine tool capability. It's a very specific term. I'm sure if you Google it or look it up in Wikipedia or the engineer's toolbox, you'll find out what it is. I know the slides that I use when I teach a lecture on this, I copied from the internet. So Google is your friend here. But see if you can find as, but you should group and discuss as you're doing it. Okay, ready, one, two, three. And we'll reconvene in between five and 10 minutes, depending on when you get your three slides done. So we ask about machine tool capability when we're wondering, can this machine make this part? If, if that wasn't clear. <laughs> so we've got, a, we've got a drawing for the part. We say, can I use this machine to make it? That's when we're worried about things like capability. Ability is the state of the 
There's a definition and there's a formula.
Should have a prize for the group that does the best presentation first. Sounds like my wireless headphones feed, feeding back on each other, but I'm not wearing them and you guys shouldn't be able to hear it. Maybe it's from the alien space balloons that we've been shooting down. You guys heard about that, right? Yeah. First we blame the Chinese, and the Chinese are like, yeah, we want that back, by the way. And then, uh, and then all of a sudden there's more, and they're like, what about Chinese ones came from China? <laughs> Flying octagons the size of small cars. Yeah. I think they're aliens. It'd be pretty funny if they were aliens. I think they're like, they we're killing them because it's not like an alien spaceship, it's like an alien. Like a bee. Right. So, like, it's around. Yeah. 
and they're gonna come back and say, say hello to my little friend. <laughs> All right, you guys ready? Not quite ready. And remember, the purpose of these slides is to start the discussion, not to finish it. <laughs> so yeah, so whatever you got, post it. But this is the kind of thing that, as a as a young engineer, you'll be. Uh, Hired by I don't know who wants to go work at GE Aerospace. Anybody? No. Who wants to go work at a place that pays you? <laughs> okay. So and who's old? Okay, so just me. So as a young engineer, when you go to uh, go to a new job, you might be told, "Hey." We need to run a capability study, or we need to know if this machine is capable to make these parts for this big customer over here. And when they ask you that, of course, they assume that you know what they're talking about, right? Or they have an office pool that you're not invited to participate in. It's like, see if he knows what CPK is, right? And so it's totally okay to ask them, hey, what do you mean by that? Oh, I never had to do that. Those stupid people at WPI never taught me how to do that, right? And uh, and then if they've seen this video, they'll know at least we talked about it. But uh, let's, uh, but this is kind of the, the thing, and I, I um, let's see what we got. Who wants to go first? Group one, okay. All right, so, you, and you don't have to come up here. We'll just go through your slides and talk about it. So, title slide, I like it. Did I say three or four slides? So this is three or four, I will agree. <laughs> all right, so, all right, so when somebody from, somebody from the group, when we say machine tool capability, what is it that we're trying to understand? Right, so it's not the capability of the machine tool itself, right? It's the capability of the machine to make a specific part. That, that's fair. And, and the machine will have different capability depending on the different part. Um, oh, and you can, there's standards, huh? Okay, so this and so you looked up, you found out there was some standards, and which you had a big group. So somebody went down the path of trying to read the standard and understand what it meant. No, no, skip that, huh? All right, but you came up with machine capability equations. Is that like your Google search term, machine capability equations? That would have been a valid search term. For, uh, for understanding this, right? Somebody says, oh, there's an equation. Just go look it up. That, that would be a valid search term. What do we got? So, oh, it's the microphone. It's my jump rope. The microphone. Okay, so machine capability equations. So, CM. So, what's... USL minus LSL. So that's the tolerance range, that's the upper spec limit. Upper spec limit, upper spec limit minus the lower spec limit. So that means we can't determine capability of a machine without knowing the tolerance. What's the tolerance on though? Tolerance is on the part. So this is reinforcing our understanding that machines will have different capabilities depending on different parts. Okay. And Six times six what? Uh, standard deviation. So, and how do you find the standard deviation? You don't have to tell me the equation, but what's the process? 
you need a bunch of data points. You plug them into Excel and you do STDEV or equals STDEV and then you highlight the data points. Yep. Okay, that's how I do it. What if, but you can't find the capability without making the parts? Because it kind of sucks if you have to make all the parts before you decide that you can't make the parts, doesn't it? So, but let's, oh, and then they gave you some rules of thumb. So if the CM is greater than or equal to 1.67, it's satisfactory enough. <laughs> Um, did you did you make up these things or did you copy it from some table? <laughs> from a cited source. From a cited source, Wikipedia. No, no, no. <laughs> it's, it's I just because even my grammar is better than that. <laughs> but but we know what it means, right? We're engineers, so we we know what the words mean. So. No, but you don't have all the equations here, right? Because you didn't tell us how to find the MK. Right, but but you got to start it. Oh, you got another slide, though. Maybe you did. Okay. All right. But the idea here is that the machine is capable if the difference between the upper and lower limits, so this is the range of acceptable parts, right? So if, if the range of acceptable parts divided by six standard deviations of the parts you make is greater than one, right? But we'd like it to be greater than 1.67. But if it's less than one, then machine can't make the parts. Does that mean you can't make the parts on the machine? If, if you really wanted to, you could either adjust the uh, tolerance limits or uh, So yeah, if you control the design, you can make this bigger, right? So when you get a number that's less than one, <laughs> It doesn't mean it's impossible to make that part on that machine. It means it's expensive to make that part on that machine. Because assuming it's actually a normal distribution, some of the parts will be okay. So if you make enough parts and you throw out the bad ones, you can make that part on that machine. It's just expensive. But what we want to be able to do here is be able to make the parts so well that we never make a bad part so we can skip the inspection step. If we know that our process cannot physically make a bad part, there's no reason to do the inspection on that dimension. Right. So do you guys find some more in addition to what we got here? Yeah, we I'll bring up your slides. I think this was a good start. Starts the discussion. Group four. Group four gets credit even though they don't show up, huh? Oh, you're group four? Yeah. Oh, last time we did group three? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, so oh, this was not three or four slides. There's three. There's this was really kind of one or two slides. Okay. So we have mostly the same things. Uh, the, one, the one addition that we have is we had the CMK. Yep. Okay. It's uh, CMK is. I'm gonna make the screen go up. And what was on your last slide? Pretty much what the information accounts for. Okay. All right. Let me make the screen go up. But I'll leave the uh, equations there. And so. Now, is it always sigma? So this plus or minus three sigma here is equal to six sigma. See the relationship there. Is it always sigma that we use here? Anybody find that we use anything else? 
So there's a, there's a version of this where you use an assumed sigma based on the number of points that you're going to have. And that way you look it up on a chart instead of making all the pieces. So you can, the assumption is though, that if you made a whole bunch of parts and let's say, let's say the feature we're controlling for is diameter. It doesn't matter. It could be length. It could be diameter. It could be surface roughness. It could be color. Doesn't matter what the thing is. As long as we can put a tolerance on it, you can do this. But if you measure a whole bunch of parts, then you plot all those diameters. And so this is the what is this? The nominal. So if we have a nominal value here, and somewhere out here is. One, two, three, one, two, three. <clears throat> so if our process is in control, it's going to look something like this. We've got a normal distribution of parts, and it's centered on the mean. So if, the, if this value is bigger, then it's shifted to one side or the other. Right. And so in your, what is this? The C, CMK, right? So if our CMK is not, what's, what's the perfect CMK? Is it zero? Uh, is one point. Well, theoretically, a uh, perfect CMK is when it's equal to the CM. Right. Right. Okay. So and when it's greater than the CM, it's, it's shifted to one side. When it's less than the CM, it's shifted to the other side. Right. And so if it's shifted, if our, so this is what we want. If when we measure it, it's like that, it's probably not capable because only these parts would have been good. Right. But we could probably fix it by calibrating our machine and shifting the curve back over. So if our CMK is off, we can probably fix the process. <coughs> if this is a good process and this is what we actually measure, is the process capable, right? Super capable. So it's like when we're, uh, when we go to kick a field goal. So if we're, if we're shooting to get it between the two posts, as long as it's between the two posts, it works, right? So the, the process is capable as long as it gets between the two posts, but should we shoot for this post over here in the side? Well, if we know we always hook right, right? If we know we always hook the other direction, maybe you should shoot a little bit towards the other one, right? That's that adjustment of moving our curve over. <clears throat> but if we've got a skinnier curve, we can shoot for anywhere in there and it'll still work, right? So that's our understanding of machine tool capability. And this is, and you can do this either by doing an experiment, making a bunch of parts, doing the calculation, or you can look up, I think it's a sigma with a bar over it that we use. You can look up that sigma bar, in one of your statistics books, and you can figure out, instead of the CPK, we do the PPK. All right. So let's get back to my, we can't make it machine for the army. So why was it that they couldn't make the thing? Because with the, all the individual steps, we said we could automate, right? Well, the problem was that they called up, they, they said it, when they realized they couldn't do it with a, um, with a six axis robot, because it was just too much force, too much lever arm, it was bouncing all around when they tried to do the machining part of it. And I said, you guys should just go buy a machine tool. They said, oh, well, what would the machine tool have to do? Right? What would the capability of the machine have to be? And um, 
they didn't know, right? Because they're the they're the dreamers, not the engineers that make helicopter engines. So they called up the people, well, transmission in this case, but whatever. They called up the people at Sikorsky and says, hey, if I wanted to buy one machine that could make all the parts in your engine, what kind of tolerance would I have to hold? Right, because you got to know the tolerances in order to figure out capability. <laughs> the engineer wasn't expecting the question, of course. He thought for a little bit. He says, I think you've got one machine that can hold five tenths. You can make any part in our engine. Of course, he's thinking of the operator doing the setup, right? The engineer. And they said, okay, so now we need to be able to hold five tenths true position between different features on the part. <coughs> but the thing we're putting in the machine is a meter cubed. And it's a five axis operation, so we need a five axis trunnion type machine tool that can hold five tenths true position over a meter cubed. And that was when the machine tool manufacturer says, oh yeah, we can make that. It's only $6 million or it's only $14 million, right? Because they're guaranteeing that no matter where it is in the machine, it's within five tenths of where they said it was, including when it's cutting, right? And those cutting forces and deflections and stuff like that. But the thing that allows you to get those tight tolerances, oh, and come on, they didn't need five tenths. They were machining a casting. They needed five thou maybe, and not true position in the machine, like to the, to the bolt circle that it was next to. Right, so they needed that, they may have needed five tenths precision, but only between here and here, not across the whole volume of the machine. So they really misunderstood what it was they needed. And the reason was they didn't want to have a skilled operator at the machine. That was their goal, to eliminate the need for any skilled operator so that they unload the shipping container, bring the broken transmission housing into the machine, press the button, come back a few days and it's fixed. That was their goal. And that was why I said it was impossible. Not because any of the individual steps were impossible to automate. It's really that setup. It's that, it's that understanding of the fact that the tool, the, the tool offset adds together with the work offset. It's that understanding that that fixed ring has to locate it and keep it from moving, including vibrating. And, um, it's that understanding that often you can get a more precise location or a more precise tool offset when you're doing the step by hand. So yes, it is possible to automate the step. Often it's easier to be more precise when you're doing it manually. So all they really needed was a skilled operator. Then they could have easily done what they wanted to do. They probably could have even done it with the robot with the five axis and the tool changer. I wouldn't do it that way. All right. How's the groups going? How's the project going? You just made some gears. Have you handed off those gears to anybody that might need to use them or made arrangements? I guess who needs the gear next? Austria. Okay. So who else has made a part besides the gears? Get close. Yeah, we fully set up the fourth axis with the fixture plate. So next time we go, we see the program and then the part. Okay. And did you get a chance to make any more round pieces? You're going today. Okay. We need to make sure there's somebody there to help you today because we're not normally open this morning. Right? Last last week, we made sure that there was going to be somebody there to help you. But uh, I'll, I'll walk over with you make sure there's somebody there. Um. All right. How about how about group three? How are you guys going? How's group three doing with making parts? Okay. All right. But we'll uh, we'll touch on that. If you guys need help, uh, reach out sooner rather than later. 
Um, and you were going to get with Adam to get access to get the card thick with the injection molder out, right? Uh, I think Ryan told me he actually already moved it at the end of last week. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I saw it. All right, great. Yeah. 